Okay, the Committee on Urban Affairs will come to order. Clerk, call the roll. Chair Lozano. Here. Vice Chair Gates. Here. Bernal. Here. Cortez. Here. Cunningham. Here. Gonzalez. Present. Hayes. Here. Remetal. Here. Tepper. Here. Quorum is present. Thank you, members, for, for your patience. Uh, members, it's the Chair's intent to take up pending business first. Uh, members, the Chair lays out it's House Bill 2071 as pending business. Members, this is Chairman Jaton's PFC bill. We adopted the substitute last Friday in our formal hearing. The Chair recognizes Chairman Jaton to speak on the bill. Thank you, Chairman and members. Um, don't have anything else to lay out uh, in addition to what I've laid out the last committee hearing, but uh, happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, uh, I guess I reserve my right to close. Okay, can I ask a few questions? Or do you want to, or just when, you're, when you do your amendments? Or is he going to be there to answer? Do you, okay. do you want to ask? Um, can I ask if there's some amendments I want to add? Not my amendments, because I'm not before. Okay, members, any questions? No. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Tom. We'll let you reserve the right to close. Uh, is there anyone else wishing to speak on the bill? Hearing none, uh, Chair recognizes Chairman Jaton to close. All right, thank you, Chair. I'll close. Okay, members. Uh, members, is there any further discussion before we proceed to the bill to, for a vote on the bill? Okay, uh, members, uh, Chair recognizes Vice Chair Gates. Yeah, I have some amendments I would like to uh, offer. Okay. So. Members, uh, we've uh, consulted with the parliamentarian's office, uh, so I'm going to be very specific on what I read here. A committee substitute cannot be amended after it has been adopted. In order to amend the bill, the committee would have to reconsider that vote by which the committee substitute was previously adopted. Representative Gates, do you move to reconsider the motion previously adopted to adopt the committee substitute? Yes. Okay. Okay, members, and an I in this vote would be to open the bill. Uh, two amendments. Two amendments. Yeah, uh, open the bill to amendments. So, members, just a reminder that a yes is for opening the bill up for amendments, a no is keeping the bill closed and proceed to a vote on the bill. Okay. Clerk will call the roll. Chairman Lozano? No. Vice Chair Gates? Yes. Bernal? No. Cortez? No. Cunningham? No. Gonzalez? No. Hayes? No. Rumetal? Yes. Tepper? No. To be 7 2. Seven okay, two members, being seven, 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 seven. Be, there being two eyes, seven no's. Yes, that's right. Yes. Uh, the motion fails. The motion fails. Okay, uh, the chair moves that House Bill 2071, as substituted, be reported to the full House with a recommendation that it do pass and be printed. The clerk will call the roll. Chair Lozano? Aye. Vice Chair Gates? No. Bernal? Yes. Cortez? Yes. Cunningham? Yes. Gonzalez? Aye. Hayes? Yes. Rometto? Yes. Tepper? Aye. Okay, there being eight ayes and one nay, the motion prevails. We can skip that. We can skip that. Okay. Uh, pending business, Chair lays out House Bill 3136 as pending business. Members, this is Representative Compos's bill that requires the Texas uh, TDHCA to issue the development owner an IRS form 8609 no later than the 30th day after the date the development owner submits to the department an 8609 documentation packet. The chair offers up a committee substitute to HB 3136. Is there any objection to the adoption of the committee substitute? Hearing none, the substitute is adopted. The chair moves that House Bill 3136 has substituted be reported to the full House with a recommendation that it do pass and be printed and sent to the Committee on Local and Consent Calendars. The clerk will call the roll. 
Chair Lozano? Aye. Vice Chair Gates? Aye. Bernal? Yes. Cortez? Yes. Cunningham? Yes. Gonzalez? Aye. Hayes? Aye. Vermetal? Aye. Tepper? Aye. Okay, there being nine ayes, zero nays, the motion prevails. The chair lays out House Bill 2455 as pending business. The chair offers up a committee substitute to House Bill 2455. Is there any objection? Hearing none, the substitute is adopted. Members, you will remember this bill by Representative King, Tracy King, relating to an annual occupational medical examination for firefighters. The committee sub uh, just made this a legislative council draft. The chair moves that House Bill 2455 is substituted, be reported to the full house with a recommendation that it do pass and be printed. The clerk will call the roll. Chair Lozano? Aye. Vice Chair Gates? Aye. Bernal? Yes. Cortez? Yes. Cunningham? Yes. Gonzalez? Yes. Hayes? Yes. Vermetal? Yes. Tepper? Aye. I know. Okay. There being uh, nine ayes and zero nays, the motion prevails. Oh, we can skip. Are you ready for? Yeah. Okay. Okay, members, the chair lays out House Bill 3568 as pending business. The chair offers up uh, a committee substitute. Is there any objection to the adoption of the committee substitute? Hearing on the substitute is adopted. Members, uh, as you will remember, this is Vice Chair Gates' bill relating to certain public facilities used to provide affordable housing. Um, I, I do, it's my understanding that uh, we, we did get a committee substitute, committee substitute language. Uh, some of the committee members have ex expressed concern that it adds 13 pages. Uh, they, are there any questions, members, for Vice Chair Gates? Or this is the... Thirty-five sixty-eight. Oh. Chairman. Yes, sir. Chairman. Uh, Representative Bernal. Thank you. Um, maybe uh, an amendment, an amendment that size. Uh, maybe the vice chairman can talk about the substance of the amendment, or if it's things we've heard before, or if they're brand new, just to add some clarity. Yes, yeah, so when, I, when I laid out the bill, I had a type version from Ledge Council, but it wasn't a final, hadn't gone through the final uh, review process. So this Ledge Committee substitute has gone through the final process. And what the, uh, uh, I mean, it defined, and then these are the things that I talked about. It defines um, who has to approve a PFC and that 60% of the tax savings must go into actually verify for lower rents and modified income definitions for the 80%, 60%, 50%, and 30% level. It defines what affordable rent is and the minimum number of two and three bedrooms at each income level um, and the minimum bedroom size and then capital improvements for acquisitions. Uh, it defines what capital improvements must be for acquisitions for existing properties. So just, just so I'm clear, and if it's different, let me know, and I think I'm speaking on behalf of a lot of folks. The bill you laid out prior was a typed out non-ledge council draft, and you went over the substance of that bill. And today, we have the identical bill but it's a ledge council draft. In other words, the, thir the, the 13 page amendment is not new compared to what we heard last week. It's just a ledge council draft of what you already had. Is that right or am I wrong about that? That's right, it had a type version on what was gonna be added. So there's nothing. Substantial changes. Okay. Yes, there's no substantial changes from that. So in other words, you laid it out, it was the type version, now we have what's essentially the same bill, but it's the ledge council draft of that bill. Correct. Nothing else is different. The, nothing's substantial, no. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, Chairman, I think the Representative Gonzalez. Yes, Representative Gonzalez. 
So you said nothing substantial changes were made. I mean, uh, Mr. Chair, I make a motion to <clears throat> postpone the vote on this until we have an opportunity to actually review these additional 13 pages um, before we vote on it. Okay. Here. Do not recognize her for that motion, but say you can you can leave it in. You can just leave it pending. Just say leave okay. it pending for that objection. Okay, members. Um, Okay, members. Um, if if it's okay, members, we're, we're um, yeah. But uh, Vice Chair Gates would like us to vote uh, on his on his bill, and um, um, we we'll just pr proceed with that vote. Um, the chair moves that House Bill thirty five sixty eight as substituted be reported to the full House with a recommendation that it do pass and be printed. The clerk will call the roll. Chair Lozano? No. Vice Chair Gates? Yes. Bernal? <clears throat> Chairman, can I ask a question? No. In the middle of the All right. No. Cortez? No. Cunningham? No. Gonzalez? No. Hayes? Yes. Hermetto? Yes. Tepper? No. Six. Okay. There being three ayes and six nays, the motion fails. Chair Leas? Uh, you want to go with your shirt? Uh, final item, members of pending business, the chair lays out House Bill 883. The chair offers up a committee substitute to House Bill 883. Is there any objection to the adoption of the committee substitute? Hearing none, the substitute is adopted. Members, this is Representative Romero's bill relating to the regulation of migrant labor housing facilities. The chair moves that House Bill 883 is substituted, be reported to the full house with a recommendation that it do pass and be printed. Uh, I, Members, uh, the clerk will call the roll. Chairman Lozano? Aye. Vice Chair Gates? Aye. Bernal? Yes. Cortez? Yes. Cunningham? Yes. Gonzalez? Aye. Hayes? Yes. Hermetto? Yes. Tepper? No. Okay. There being eight ayes and one nay, the motion prevails. Okay, members, now we will go on to today's agenda. Chair lays out House Bill 1677 and recognizes Chairman Jaton to explain the bill. Thank you, Chairman and members. I'm here to lay out House Bill 1677, which creates a verification process for homeless individuals to obtain birth certificates or IDs. It's also it's also exempts homeless individuals from having to pay associated fees with those state uh, with the state to obtain these documents. These bills will be the bill will provide will provide homeless individuals with an avenue to obtain proper identification, which is essential to helping them get jobs and work um, work uh, work to change their circumstances. The 
idea of this bill originated from the Fort Bend Sheriff's Office, uh, which is which is seeing increased in homelessness with many homeless individuals in Fort Bend County are women and families and the issue of providing their uh, pro proving their identity keeps them from being able to access certain services and apply for jobs. Homeless individuals often encounter difficulties in accessing uh, essential identification documents such as driver's license and or birth certificates especially homeless individuals who are also victims of domestic violence individuals need some sort of ide identification to obtain a, obtain a birth certificate and sometimes need a birth certificate to obtain an id without verification there is a significant obstacle to homeless individuals applying for jobs services or housing therefore it is essential for the uh, to establish a pathway for homeless individuals to obtain identification through homeless shelter process that uh, finds ways for to verify uh, individuals and identity House Bill 1677 aims to assist homeless individuals by ensuring state registrars, local registrars, county clerks, uh, and county clerks will issue certified copy of, of a homeless individual's birth certificate without any fee. This, this instructs department to adopt procedures to verify a person's stat, status as a homeless individual, including using homeless shelter verification and prescribed documentation necessary for the issuance of birth certificate. The, the bill also authorizes DPS to do the same in issuing ID and driver's license. The process does not register an individual to vote. That's an important part. An individual must have an address to be, to be able to register to vote. Its license can be used to verify identity um, at the polls, but only in the county where the person is already registered to vote. The voter's registration process is a separate process. By ending homeless individual, uh, individuals to, by enabling homeless individuals to readily access certified copy of the birth certificate. House Bill 1677 seeks to alleviate the bureauc bureaucratic challenges they face in applying for job services and housing and allow them to work to change their circumstances. This time I'm happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, I reserve the right to close. Thank you, Representative. Members, any questions? No questions, and uh, we'll proceed to testimony. Chair calls Lisa Daughtry. Okay. Hi, Ms. Daughtry, thank you for being here. Good afternoon, Chairman Lozano, committee members. Yes, I'm Lisa Daughtry with the Texas Department of Public Safety. Okay. I'll be glad to answer any questions you may have. Members, uh, as our resource witness, do you have any questions? I've got one question, I guess. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How much are these documents for the general public, anyhow? Okay, so for a driver license, a regular driver license for eight year term is $33, and for an ID card, um, the cost is um, 16. Thank you. You're welcome. Did you say birth certificate is 16? No, no, sir. I, I was talking about driver license and ID cards. Under I'm with the Department of Public Safety. Thank you. You're welcome. Members, any more questions? Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, members, uh, last witness wishing to testify on this bill is uh, JJ Ramirez. Chair calls JJ Ramirez. Thank you for being here, sir. You can start off with your name, uh, if you represent yourself or an organization, and your position on the bill. Chair members, my name is JJ Ramirez. Um, I'm an organizer at the Texas Harm Reduction Alliance, and we are in support of 1677. Uh, many of our members are largely comprised of people who are unhoused, and uh, the struggle for our neighbors to obtain money every day to apply for these applications is extremely overwhelming. Um, often these documents are specifically required for employment, access to housing, ser uh, housing services to include vouchers, rapid rehousing programs, um, at local section eight oh, places and, and medical appointments and so much more, right? And these, these uh, our members, um, their, their items are often caught up in sweeps that are in direct impact of the camping ban. And these people just indiscriminately throw everything into the garbage. That includes the documents in this bill. So this places many people backed into the mindset of damned if I do and damned if I don't. If I'm having to save money to just make my basic needs to stay alive and then come up with this money to buy my driver's license, to have it thrown away, lot or literally a lot of the times the very next day, just it's just not it's just not acceptable. This is like, this is the very smallest step that the state can do to help combat the homelessness crisis that's happening across Texas. And we just urge you guys to vote yes on this bill. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Members, any questions? Thank you, sir. Appreciate you. Okay. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on, for, or against House Bill 1677? Hearing none, the chair recognizes Chairman Jaton to close. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to lay out this bill. Happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, I close. Members, any questions? 
Officer, thank you so All much. Right. Thank you. Okay. With that, the chair will withdraw House Bill 1677 and leave it pending at this time. The chair lays out House Bill 4227 and recognizes Chairman Goldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members uh, of the committee. And I see you have a sub. The, the I chair, do. The chair lays out a complete committee sub and recognizes Chairman Goldman to explain the sub. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. House Bill 4227 and the committee substitute builds upon protection for our first responders, especially departments with municipal civil service agreements. After the passage of House Bill 1900 in the 87th legislature, civil service agreements have been targeted by petition style ballots or propositions to impede current law. House Bill 4227 addresses the concerns of the departments and municipalities with a population of less than 1 million. The committee substitute changes this population threshold to 900,000. House Bill 4227 aims to protect those dollars and contracts entered with municipalities to first responder budgets, ultimately protect communities across our state. With that, I'd be happy to stand, happy to answer any questions. Members, any questions? No questions, we'll let you reserve the right Thank to close. Chair calls Robin Krause. Good afternoon, Chairman and Committee. Um, thank you for letting me come and speak to you this afternoon. Uh, this is the first time I've ever done anything like this, so please bear with me. I didn't bring any notes, and I'll try to keep it short. My name is Robin Krause, and I'm from Fort Worth, Texas. I've been a police officer for 37 years. I am here to show support for Representative Goldman's bill. Um, being so, the, the, the I'm sorry. Oh, House Bill 4277. Thank you. 4227. I'm going to stop for a second. You're doing great. Um, I'm in support of this bill because I've been an officer for 37 years. I can tell you one of the comforts that I had being in a city that has civil service is that I knew if I ever was accused or made a mistake myself that I would be afforded the same due process as any other citizen with regards to my job. Um, I also support civil service and the fact that it opens the door for everyone. Uh, I believe one of the best, best advantages of civil service is it <laughs> levels the playing field and it takes away what is always often common referred to as the good old boy system. It allows anyone that wants to do the job, put in the work, and want to advance their careers to do so. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, One of the, the, the things that I'm fearful of uh, that this bill would help us avoid is that 143 civil service would be attacked because a lot of people don't understand and they believe that civil service protects officers that do bad things. I can tell you after 37 years, I have never seen that happen. Um, I think the same, it's along the same lines of misunderstandings about qualified immunity and things like that. Um, so I believe that Civil service helps cities recruit qualified personnel because they know that they'll be working in an environment where they do are, are afforded due process. So thank you for letting me speak with you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any questions? No question. Thank you, sir. Chair calls Jennifer Szymanski. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Jennifer Szymanski, Director of Public Affairs for the Combined Law Enforcement Associations of Texas, or CLEAT. We're here in support of House Bill 4227. We represent over 27,000 law enforcement officers across the state of Texas, to include nearly all the major cities, police officers, and large urban counties, sheriff's deputies, and their associations. Local Government Code Chapter 143 addresses municipal civil service for firefighters and police officers. The purpose of this chapter is to secure efficient fire and police departments composed of ca capable person personnel who are free from political influence and who have permanent employment tenure as public servants. Law enforcement professional standards are achieved at a much higher rate in municipalities and counties that have adopted civil service. Professional standards as well as peace officers' ability to operate in an environment free of political influence is imperative 
as we attempt to move toward progress in the profession. In several large municipalities across the state of Texas, anti-police activist groups have been successful in gaining the signatures required on a petition to place propositions on the ballot that impede on state law. These groups are Soros-funded activists who file into City Hall and make a full-time living misleading the public. The ease at which they have been able to enact illegal ordinances via the ballot is alarming. In Austin, we already know that these groups are willing to put the language on the ballot that they know to be illegal, and even at the advice of city attorneys, refuse to acknowledge this information and continue to push their anti-police narrative. The next threat to public safety in this regard would be a ballot initiative to repeal chapter 143 of the local government code in municipalities that have adopted the chapter for their police and fire. It is imperative that we maintain the highest level of professional standards put forth in chapter 143 that our officers maintain their working conditions and rights. The recruiting, hiring, promoting discipline and firing of officers should remain standardized, transparent and honest. It should involve due process at every step, and it's our firm belief as representatives of over 27,000 officers that municipalities' ability to remain under Chapter 143 is paramount to public safety and the ability for large municipalities to recruit quality police officers. Thank you for your time and consideration on this bill. Members That's all I have, Chairman. Thank you, ma'am. Members, any questions? No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Chair calls Thomas Villarreal. Thank you for being here, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, committee members. My name is Detective Thomas Villarreal, I'm President of Austin Police Association, the labor organization that represents the 1,496 officers who are left at the Austin Police Department. I'm here today in support of HB 20, uh, sorry, 4227. I'll try to keep my comments short. My chosen profession is under attack. It's under attack by far left self-admitted police abolitionists. In Austin, Texas, this attack has been going on since 2017. Local Government Code 143.01 clearly states that the code was created to quote, secure efficient fire and police departments composed of capable personnel who are free from political influence and who have permanent employment tenure as public servants. In the past six years, Austin activists have worked to dismantle our police department. My city has spent thousands of dollars on multiple studies going all the way back to 2012 to try to figure out what adequate police staffing should be for a city of our size. In the summer of 2020, the Austin Police Department was defunded $150 million, and we had our, uh, our police staffing cut by 150 positions. When I introduced myself just a second ago, I very intentionally gave the current numbers of the officers at the Austin Police Department. Based on the past few staffing studies, it is well accepted by many people within our city that we should be up over 2,000 officers. I only bring this up because this attack on our officers and our department is directly responsible for the major decline in numbers and our inability to attract and recruit new officers to the Austin Police Department. It is my belief that the next attack uh, the activists will wage will be on 143. There's no doubt in my mind that the police abolitionists that I'm working against would love to limit officers' rights to due process and would prefer that the Austin Police Association did not have the right to meet and confer. I wanna give a little bit of history for everyone in here. Prior to 143, people like myself were not welcome into this profession. My grandfather, who was born in Rios, Texas in 1923 and grew up in Jim Wells County, did not have the ability to take a civil service test like I did to enter this profession. It's amazing how much 143 has changed this profession in the past 100 years. I'm asking for this committee to help me stand up to the anti-police activists who want to pull Austin backwards 100 years. Thank you. Great job, members. Any questions? I grew up um, about 10, 15 miles from Rios in Premont. That's where my that's where my grandmother still lives. Yeah, that's so awesome. Thanks, sir. Yes, sir. Chair calls Matt McCowiak. Thank you for being here, sir. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, here testifying on, my, on behalf of myself. Um, thank you to the members of the committee. Thank you to <clears throat> the bill author, Representative Goldman. Um, we don't have to. Uh, I'm sorry, Matt McCoviak, HR, uh, House Bill 4227. For in support, yeah, I'm sorry. Great. Thank you, sir. All right, am I good now? Sorry. <laughs> I do, I do, I do. Um, 
we don't have to guess at the direction that um, some of our largest cities are, are headed uh, because we could look at, at what's, what's happened over the last three or four years. And I recognize for a lot of members who may not um, live in and represent our largest urban cities, uh, some of this may seem um, impossible or unlikely or scary. Uh, and it certainly is scary. Uh, as, you, as you all sit here, you are in a uh, state capital now that has roughly 400 fewer police officers than it did just two years ago. Um, the activists have been working since 2017 to decimate our police force in Austin. Um, they have been successful up to this point. Uh, the reason that we now believe 143 is at risk uh, is because of the action that this legislature took two years ago on a bipartisan basis uh, to punish cities that defund their police by at least 10 percent in a given budget year. Um, because you did that, they are now looking for a side door or a back door. Uh, 143 is absolutely at risk. Um, we will not have municipal police departments, particularly in urban areas, without 143 as a civil service protection uh, for our bravest uh, first responders. Um, so th this is desperately needed legislation that can, can, can prevent an absolute worst case scenario from, from falling upon us uh, in Austin and San Antonio and Houston and Dallas. I recognize that Austin is perhaps different than Houston, Dallas, and San Antonio. We have not seen the activists push as, as hard or certainly have as much success as they have in Austin, but they will. That day is coming. Um, so I think on a bipartisan basis, if the legislature were to step forward uh, and, and make clear that we are going to protect 143 and we're not going to let, let extreme activists on the hard left um, undermine public safety uh, and under, undermine uh, civil service, uh, I think that would be a tremendously good step for public safety in Texas. Thank you. Members, any questions? No questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, members, the final witness registered to testify on this bill is uh, the chair calls Cleo Patrick. Patricia. Oh, Thank you. Uh, Cleo. Oh. Yes, I'm sorry about that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Cleo Patricic, and I'm here in support of House Bill 4227. I live here in Austin. And you're representing yourself, ma'am? Yes, okay. I am yes, by ma myself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I live here in Austin. I'm a mom, former probation officer, and worked in social programs like Big Brothers Big Sisters. I am a Democrat, and I am a former member of the Austin Justice Coalition. Back in 2018, I donated significant money to this group and was under the false impression that this group was supporting community initiatives for police reform. After attending rallies where attendees would shout F the police and then finding out its leader, Chaz Moore, was a self-proclaimed police abolitionist, I concluded we had no common ground. I was horrified to hear him publicly state that he wants to abolish our police department. I reject such extremist views and will use whatever platform I have to call out these dangerous views that are not shared by the majority of the Austinites and Americans. Regrettably, police abolitionists Chaz Moore, Chris Harris, Kathy Mitchell, and other affiliated organizations have, have ongoing influence with our mayor and city council. Since the beginning of this whole defund police debacle, they have interfered with police contract negotiations and public safety policies. We are now facing a severe staffing crisis of 400 plus police officers due to these police abolitionists pushing their personal agenda upon our community. After achieving Austin Justice Coalition's stated goal of going after the police contract, these extremist groups' next goal is to repeal Chapter 143, making every Austin police officer an at-will employee, making their protected personnel files accessible to the same police, same police abolitionists. The stated purpose of Chapter 143 is to secure efficient fire and police departments composed of capable personnel who are free from political influence and who have permanent employment tenure as public servants. I am not a paid activist. I have always rejected any form of payment. My purpose has been to expose these extremists on, that are undermining the safety of our city, especially at-risk communities like the one I came from. My parents are Mexican immigrants. I grew up on food stamps. I grew up in South Dallas. My best friend was murdered, shot in the back by her ex-boyfriend. Seeing crime and poverty and other social failings was a constant in my life. That is why I chose to become a probation officer working with children and seeking social services for them. If these groups are able to repeal Chapter 143, this will have a devastating blow to police officers' due process. These police abolitionists will have full access to G-files and have the possibility of releasing private information to the public. 
These same abolitionists will have access to unfounded complaints against an officer and could use this, those same unfounded complaints to have an officer terminated without cause by simply portraying an officer as an officer with high complaints and leaving out the context related to the fact that those complaints were exonerated. Chapter 143 protects against the release of unfounded complaints for a reason. Protection from radical police abolitionists like these, like those in my community, is one of those reasons. Right now, our department is unable to fill police cadet cases classes to capacity due to the consistent attack and demoralization of police officers in this city. If chapter 143 is repealed, it will have a calamitous impact on our ability to retain and recruit officers. How can an officer in Austin, Texas, the city that is successfully leading the charge to abolishing policing effectively do their jobs knowing they could be fired without cause? Interesting to note, the current police oversight election that's happening this May, which is sponsored by this same abolitionist crowd, allows a convicted felon to be a part of the board. However, as a former probation officer, I, would, I could not be on this board. This is the same type of insanity that has taken root in our city. This is not about reform for the common good of our community. This is about activists focused on acting on personal vendetta and hate for any and all law enforcement. Protecting Chapter 143 from undue exposure to political passions is necessary to safeguard a society based on thoughtful discourse. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, members. Any questions? Thank you so much. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on, for, or against House Bill 4227? Hearing none, the chair recognizes Chairman Golden. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee are closed. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman Golden. With that, the chair withdraws uh, the committee substitute to House Bill 4227 and leaves it pending at this time. The chair lays out House Bill 1661 and recognizes Chairman Burns to explain the bill. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members. Thanks for having me here today. Um, so before session began, my local police chief, Rob Severance of Cleburne Police Department, contacted me about a problem. See, not unlike any other municipality or employers across state, they're having a very hard time finding qualified applicants to join the police force. One of, uh, one of the seemingly arbitrary obstacles is a statutory limit on the maximum age to enter the police academy to, to start to begin becoming a, a policeman. Section 143.023C of the Local Government Code prohibits anyone over the age of 45 from being certified for a beginning position in a police department. This age prohibition is solely based on the age of the recruit and doesn't consider if the individual can pass all of the standard entry requirements and criteria that all recruits face. HB 1661 repeals the age prohibition and then goes on to simply clean up an area in statute that allows for police departments to circumvent the age requirement during times of emergency because it will no longer be necessary after the passage of the bill to just have it in times of emergency. Um, we have my police chief here from uh, Cleburne, Texas as a resource witness and um, happy to answer any questions. I do think it's interesting that, you know, I uh, hate to assume anyone's age or anything like that, but the, even the, the most elite athlete on the veteran football team would not be able to become a uh, policeman under the, because of this bill. This age limit would probably keep somebody like our own Ramon Romero, if he wanted to, from joining the police academy, which, I mean, clearly an elite athlete and capable person like that. But happy to answer any questions if there are any. <laughs> That's a great point. Uh, chairman, um, for myself, like, you know, I played football for the Cowboys, the, the Premont Cowboys. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I completely sympathize with Representative Romero. Yeah. Unjust. Yeah, it's unjust. Okay, uh, members, any questions? No questions, Chairman? Uh, members, I believe we have one witness uh, to testify. The chair calls Rob Severance. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members. My name is Rob Severance. I'm here in support of uh, House Bill 1661. I represent the Texas Police Chiefs Association. Uh, also rep represent myself. Um, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I also want to thank uh, Representative Burns for bringing this forward. Um, 
The recruiting and retention of qualified police officers continues to be a struggle for most law enforcement agencies. In many agencies, it has reached a crisis level. Uh, we support removing the age limit for a beginning position in the police department under municipal civil service. We believe this will help us recruit veterans retire, uh, retiring out of Fort Hood who have reached their 45th birthday and other qualified applicants. Um, it would also affect me, I'm over 45. <laughs> uh, thank you and I will be happy to answer any questions. Okay, members, any questions? No questions? Oh yes, Mr. Romero. Sometimes, so when you mentioned Fort Hood and uh, folks that are retiring, do some of those folks already have law enforcement experience that they might have participated in within their armed forces divisions? And and do they still have to go through the normal academy like they normally would to to be an officer in Cleburne? Um, there there are um, there are options where they can get uh, their peace officer license through an abbreviated course uh, based on uh, uh, their military experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, sir, there are uh, members who serve in military police or have law enforcement experience. Uh, we send our uh, recruiters down to Fort Hood um, already. It's uh, you know great to be able to recruit people we can, and we'd like to expand that to those who are over 45. Yeah, great, Bill. All right, members, any more questions? Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Is there any, anyone else wishing to testify on for or against House Bill 1661? Seeing none, Chair recognizes Chairman Burns to close on this bill. Again, uh, appreciate your time. Happy to answer any questions, but if there aren't any, I respectfully close and ask for your favorable consideration. Members, any questions? No questions. Thank you so much, Chairman. Thank you very much. With that, the Chair withdraws House Bill 1661 and leaves it pending at this time. Chair lays out House Bill 4769 and recognizes Representative Gervin Hawkins to explain the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, uh, for giving me this opportunity to lay out this important piece of legislation. So members, I've heard from several of my constituents about the need to improve pedestrian infrastructure. In some neighborhoods, there hasn't been any substantial government improvement in decades. Texas ranks as the 12th most dangerous state for pedestrians under the Smart Growth American Dangerous Design uh, Report of 2022. San Antonio, which I represent, ranks as the 20th most dangerous metropolitan area for pedestrians in the United States. Stakeholders in my constituencies have repeated repeatedly express their dissatisfaction with pedestrian infrastructure related to sidewalks, curbs, or pedestrian lighting. House Bill 46, 4769 will create a grant program through the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs for neighborhood organizations to improve impoverished and abandoned areas. This grant program will help families by improving their living conditions and by making their neighborhoods safer. Improving visibility and encouraging pedestrian traffic are tenets of, of a crime prevention program, which has shown to decrease, decrease robberies between 30 to 84%. The National Crime Prevention Council, National Institute of Crime uh, Prevention Program works and its measures is to improve community safety. Sidewalks are associated with significant reduction in pe pedestrian collision with motor vehicles, such families also improve mobility for pedestrian and provide access for all types of pedestrian travel to and from home, work, parks, schools, shopping areas, and transient stops. Sidewalks create the appropriate environment for walking, the, walking and the public having the proper right of way. And lighting not only makes it easier for drivers to see pedestrians, but also improves pedestrians' abilities. This program is so important, particularly those areas in the ETJ and in the counties where uh, that has been neglected over the years. So all this bill does is create that grant program through TDHCA so these neighborhoods who have been underserved, unseen, uh, can get the help that they need. With that, uh, Mr. Chair, I would respectfully ask uh, for, for this uh, program to be fo favorably voted out of committee. 
Great, thank you, members. Yes, Representative Bernal. Representative, yes. Great bill. Um, so the, the way it work is that there'd be this grant program and then a community organization would apply for it to do a project in a certain neighborhood. Yes. And since we share a city and borders, if for those of you who don't know, say like San Antonio, it's like there's whole parts of town where they never installed sidewalks. That's right. I can tell you from my time at city council that the cost of a nonprofit or a private citizen doing sidewalks is about eight to 10 times cheaper than when the city does it. Yes. So the bang for your buck, I think, is, is significantly better. Yes. Um, thank you for bringing this. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Members, any questions? I have a question. Normally, these cities do this. Um, how did you get the idea to bring it to the legislature? Because certain areas are highly neglected. You know, what I can say is that, um, not throwing shade on anybody, but the usual suspects normally are able to get served. But there are several areas, particularly in my district and around uh, our districts, uh, really have not seen any sidewalks. And so the thinking is, if they're not one of the chosen ones, mm -hmm. that there is an opportunity to still have safe, safe sidewalks and streets. All right, thank you. No questions. Thank you. Well, uh, got one witness, and we'll let you reserve the right to close. Yes, I reserve my right to close, Mr. Yes, Chair. Thank you. Uh, members, have got one witness. Um, chair calls Jay Blasick Crossley. Hello, my name is Jay Blazek Crossley, and I'm executive director of a nonprofit called Farm and City, and uh, we are in support of HB 4769. Um, and thank you, Chair Canales, and members for your time and for your support of safe sidewalks for the people of Texas. Um, I wanted to share with you three reasons we support this bill. I brought you one report from the U U.S. Center for Disease Control. Uh, my point in giving this to you is simply that the lack of minimally acceptable pedestrian transportation system in Texas is a public health issue. Uh, because Texans are afraid to walk on unsafe streets or have uh, no reasonable option with broken or missing sidewalks, we're all more overweight, we're all more stressed out, and more isolated. Uh, the state has a meaningful obligation to help the people of Texas fix their neighborhoods uh, to be safe and comfortable to walk and use a wheelchair and get around. Uh, there is a safety element to this, um, as mentioned previously, and I know uh, Chair Lozano has done a lot of work trying to make our streets safe. Um, and it, the inability of Texans to walk safely is, is a terrible problem every day for Texans, uh, and we need to fix that. Um, and then finally, uh, just building sidewalks creates more jobs per dollar spent um, than any other type of investments in transportation. Uh, because if you imagine, if you're going into a neighborhood to build some sidewalks, there's a crew working there, <laughs> and it's a bunch of people figuring out how to pour the concrete, and so that you actually are supporting more jobs, and there's a better economic development impact on building sidewalks and other things. So uh, with that, I strongly support this bill. Thank you. Oh, yes, sir. Members, any more questions? Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you so much, sir. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on for or against House Bill 4769? Uh, hearing none, the chair recognizes Representative Gervin Hawkins to close. If there are no further questions, I close. Great. Thank you. No, no, ma'am. Okay. Uh, with that, the uh, chair will withdraw House Bill 4769 and leave it pending at this time. And the chair lays out House Bill 4770 and recognizes Representative Gervin Hawkins to explain right. the bill. Thank, thank you, uh, Chairman Lozano. Um, this bill here, um, because I've, I spoke earlier about the concerns, and particularly uh, as it relates to uh, infrastructure in the county, mainly and again, those areas in the EJD. Uh, I won't go through the same statistics, but what this, what 4770 does, is also gives TDAC an opportunity to create a grant fund for municipalities. So where the strength isn't there in the neighborhoods, we also want to give the municipality an opportunity uh, to uh, apply and be able to get those dollars. Right now, uh, CDBG dollars are used for infrastructure and other things like that. All this would do is authorize Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs to, uh, to apply for a grant with the community to make these sidewalks happen and or lighting. With that, I reserve my right to close. Okay. Members, any questions? Okay, we'll let you reserve the right to close. Okay. Uh, 
Chair calls Jay Blazek Crossley. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Jay Blazek Crossley with Farm and City, and we are in support of HB 4770. And I'm very sorry. I'd I don't know what I said. I meant to say Chair Lozano. If I oh, didn't, yeah, um, um, I, I, Chair Canales and I, we actually grew up together. Yeah, yeah. Did I call you Eight through 12. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, I guess we're not twins, but we, we grew up in a town of 2,000 people. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> well, I meant your service on the transportation committee yes, sir. with Chair Canales. <laughs> um, I, so, I just wanted to make two quick points. Is the, the state of Texas spends quite a lot of money on transportation on roads, uh, billions and billions of dollars. Um, about 10% of the trips on our transportation system are freight, 15% uh, are commuting, and the rest is running errands. So most of the money the state spends on transportation, on building roads, is people going to HEB. Um, and so some people don't drive to get to HEB. Some people don't have a car. Some people want to use transit. And if there's not sidewalks to get to transit, um, you, you don't have as much access. And so I think there's very much a it's reasonable for the state to invest in our cities where people need to have safe ways to walk um, to get to where they need to go. And then finally, just the, the unmet need for walking in Texas is huge. TxDOT finally has done a good ADA transition plan and identified every single stretch of TxDOT roadway, um, how much missing sidewalks there are and how much it would cost to fix them. And the cost just for TxDOT on system facilities to, to come up to the 1990s ADA law is $1.6 billion. And that's not counting all the missing sidewalks in all of our cities. So I hope you'll support this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, members, any questions? Thank you so much. Yes. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on for or against House Bill 4770? Uh, hearing none, the chair recognizes Representative Gervin Hawkins to close. Mr. Chair, I close unless there's any questions. No questions. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. With that, the chair will withdraw House Bill 4770 and, and leave it pending at this time. The chair lays out House Bill 5282 uh, and recognizes Representative Anchia. Sub. Okay, uh, the chair lays out a complete committee sub for House Bill 5282 and recognizes Representative Mencia to explain the bill. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to lay out this bill. Vice Chair, good to see you. Members of the committee, appreciate your time. Uh, I always love it and, and I'm excited for when uh, Representative Gonzalez comes back, when Dallas gets to come here to the legislature and shine. Um, this bill creates a municipal management district for two of the premier assets that we have in Dallas, Fair Park and the Dallas Zoo. And this allows us, this municipal management district, allows us the ability to get a rebate on state revenue back to these geographic areas. All of you who know Dallas real well know that there's a dividing line between da uh, northern da Dallas and southern Dallas. It's I-30. I live in the southern sector, proud to represent constituents there. And the city is now directing its view on growth south. In fact, the prior mayor called his entire program Grow South. Um, and so what we're trying to do, and, and alongside uh, members of this committee who served last session, we were able to pass a really important proposition that was later adopted by the city called Prop A. It's gonna drive, allow us to do a, a replacement of both a convention center hotel and drive dollars to Fair Park. The zoo is an important asset. Some of it, uh, you may have heard about the zoo uh, in the news late, lately. We are so proud of it in Dallas, honestly. My daughter volunteers there. It is one of the great assets in the Southern sector, and we're, we're incredibly proud. So what this bill does, is really two things. It creates a governance mechanism so that we can catch and the rebate of state revenue for sales and use tax, hotel occupancy tax, and mis mixed beverage tax. Now we did this in another bill uh, two sessions ago that I was able to pass with your help for qualified convention center hotels. And you recall that when initially when that bill was filed, it was 1,000 feet. If you were within 1,000 feet, you got the state rebate. And more recently, it has been updated to 2,500 feet. Well. There's something inconvenient about the geography of both the, the state fair and uh, the zoo, and it's, it is outside of that 2,500 uh, foot radius. 
but nonetheless, they're important demand drivers for tourism in the southern sector, tourism and development. And so in San Antonio, you saw this mechanism used to create the Grand Hyatt. In Fort Worth, this mechanism was used for the Omni Hotel. Um, in Houston, the Hilton Americas, if you've ever been to that part of, of the city, it's an important green space, that, this mechanism was used for that, this state rebate, okay? The reason we, we have a, um, a governance piece of this and, are, and have put it in an MMD is that the city of Dallas has a, a, a unique structure with respect to its parks, and both, both Fair Park and the zoo are considered parks in the city of Dallas. They're owned by the city, so they are municipal, uh, they have municipal ownership, but the governance is with the park board. So it's sort of bifurcated. The park board does all of its contracting and sits as an independent agency, an independent fiduciary separate and apart from the city that manages our parks. So we're still working on the governance, I and mean, I, would, I would beseech you, uh, Vice Chair, not to vote the bill out today. I know I, it, against your better impulses, we may want to wait because we're still convening stakeholders to get their governance right, what the governance of the MMD looks like. We also have in both the uh, uh, in both Fair Park, we have Fair Park First, who is here, I'm going to testify today, and then we also have a, a nonprofit board because both of them are public-private partnerships. We have a nonprofit board for the zoo as well. So we want to make sure all these stakeholders have representation, and the governance piece still remains a work in progress. But I wanted to give you a, a general overview of this really exciting tool for development in the southern sector. Um, if, if the governing boards of either the park board or the uh, governing boards, nonprofit boards in the public-private partnerships don't want to do hotels, they don't have to. This bill doesn't force them. But if they do want to have a hotel, for example, at Fair Park, and this is a very important point, which is hosting the 2026 World Cup, and the uh, communication center for the entirety of North America that will broadcast to, to the rest of the world at Fair Park, then we really do need a hotel uh, on site to accomplish these things. And that, those, are, those are really the drivers for this tool. Again, this is a tool that we've used for a long, long time. You've seen it used in your communities. And um, here's an opportunity to do it south of I-30 for these two important assets. With that, um, since I have no right to close, and I do so only at the, at the pleasure of the chairman, I humbly beseech you the opportunity to close. <laughs> Thank you, chairman. Uh, members, any questions? It's exciting stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Gates. Okay, is this an existing municipal management district? It is not. This would be newly created. Yeah, can't you create it by getting 50% of the people that are going to be taxed? Can't they sign a petition to create it? So usually we create, and I, uh, this is my one, two, three, fourth municipal management district. We, they're always created in state statute. The levy within the, um, uh, the levy mechanism, the tax mechanism that you're talking about, is once the MMD is created in state statute, then the property owners inside the MMD vote on whether they want to tax themselves. In this case, both of the properties are city property, right? They're both owned by the city. So in this case, you only have one owner. Now, you do have a fiduciary in the park board, and that's why we're working on uh, the governance piece. So everything in this management district is city property? Precisely. So there's no private ownership? Precisely. Okay, and so is it, what is it, vacant land? No, it's the fair park and the zoo. Okay, and so that's gonna be the only property in, in this management? That's right. Okay. And, and sure, yeah, yes, Representative Conrad. Just, just to piggyback off of uh, Chair, Vice Chair Gates, so the stakeholders, is it, who are they? Is it the city? City. Officials? Our park board as the fiduciaries, right? Also the, um, the nonprofit boards in the public-private partnerships for both Fair Park, which is called Fair Park First, and they'll, they'll be testifying here. And then in the case of the zoo, they also have a nonprofit board as part of the public-private partnership, and they're here to testify as well. Okay, okay, well, I'll wait, I'll wait for them to testify. A lot, lot of stakeholders, a yeah. lot of stakeholders. Representative Tipper. Is the Dallas City Council, have they taken a position on this, or are they here to testify? Uh, the Park Board is here to testify, uh, so yes. 
Is there an opinion of the mayor of the city council? Yes, favorable. Still need to figure out the uh, governance. Governorship. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that's the one big issue. And th there are other sort of issues that the lawyers are working through. You know, one lawyer sees it one way, the one lawyer sees it the other. But the general concept of driving this rebate of state uh, state dollars to these two assets is not in con uh, not in controversy. Okay, great. Well, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Chair calls Don Moore. Good afternoon, I'm Dawn Moore and I am chairman of the zoo and we support this bill and um, subject to working on the governance and those sort of items. But I'll take my few minutes just to rave about our zoo. Our zoo is one of the top 10 in the nation. And you're representing and the zoo? I am chairman of the zoo, okay. and you're the nonprofit board. Okay, and you're speaking on their behalf. Yes, I'm right. sorry if I didn't yes, make that clear. Um, and so I just wanted to tell you about the zoo. And we just got our um, Association of Zoo and Aquariums accreditation. There's only 250 zoos in the nation out of 200. 2,500, and so I invite you to come. Saturday is Zoo Lovers Day, um, April 8th, National Zoo Lovers Day, so I encourage you to come to our fabulous asset. It is an asset for North Texas, not just Dallas, um, and I want to tell you that we have many visitors from out of our city and all around our county, so we are an asset for the state of Texas. So thank you. Great. Members, any questions? Of course. Thank you. Chair calls Ryan O'Connor. Uh, Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. I'm Ryan O'Connor. I'm an assistant director with Dallas Park and Recreation. Uh, we are in support of House Bill 5282, and we look forward to working with uh, Chairman Anchia's office on the continuation of the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, any questions? Vice Chair Gates. Okay, I'm still having... Okay, you you represent the city of Dallas, or you represent the the Park and Recreation Department? Yes, sir. Of the city of Dallas. Yes, sir. That's correct. And if I understand right, everything in this management district is owned by the city. That is correct. And so, what's the purpose of the district then? I would defer that to Chairman Anchia if he would like to uh, make that comment. But um, the the purpose is to, as he mentioned, to try to. Um, capture some of the state taxes that uh, do not currently come to those two locations. Is there, what do you mean the state taxes? There are certain state taxes such as hotel occupancy taxes, mixed beverage taxes, things of that nature that currently are go to the state and do not come to the city. This MMD would um, allow that to occur. So that'd be taking money from from the state? I, I didn't know you could do that. You just set up a management district and the state no longer gets all of its part? That is the, as I understand it, that is the way the legislation is currently drafted. Um, and so that's the, the only purpose is to capture the state's part of its taxes. Again, I would defer to Chairman Anchia to get into the details of the legislation, but okay. that is certainly one of the intentions. Representative oh, okay. Um Having had one of these and representing one now, uh, tell me if what I'm saying is correct. The, the district would allow the entities to capture money they currently, they, they currently can't, but for a very specific purpose, and that purpose would be just to put it bluntly, to create something that would then generate more, right? Um, in terms of economic activity, in terms of tourism. Uh, I think the chairman talked about being the host of the World Cup and making sure that they have the facilities they need to do that, um, not just well, but really well, because after that event comes, the reputation of the city then spreads across the globe. So this, this you don't just get to keep Tell me if I'm right. You don't just get to keep the money to spend. You get, you get to you get to use that money to do something else that then has a larger radiating effect, which would produce more tax dollars for the state in total. Is that right? Uh, I would say that um, 
the revenues that are produced are for the benefits identified in the legislation for the purposes within those districts. So for the benefits of economic development and other, other activities are identified in the legislation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Members, any more questions? No question. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Chair calls Brian Llewellyn. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, I am Brian Llewellyn, and I am representing Fair Park First. We're the 501c3 nonprofit operator of Fair Park, National Historic Landmark, and home to the great state fair of Texas. Hopefully you've all visited. If not, we expect to see you for a corny dog soon. Mm -hmm. uh, we are here today to speak in favor of this bill on the condition that we continue to work through the governance model as intimated with the chairman. Um, we're very grateful for his leadership and in bringing forward uh, really a transformational economic development tool in order to erect something that will in the future greatly contribute to the tax revenues of both Texas as well as the city of Dallas. In addition to that, this has the catalytic potential of creating new economic drivers that will sustain both of these attractions for generations. And that is sorely needed in the part of Fair Park. As my counterpart at the zoo spoke favorably of that institution, I'll wax a little poetic about Fair Park. In addition to being built in 1936 to celebrate the Texas centennial, uh, the birth of that spirit of Texas born in blood at the Battle of the Alamo, we are the single largest collection of public art uh, on display outside in the state of Texas. We're very proud of that. We're the single largest collection of art deco, art and architecture in any one place in the world. And unfortunately, uh, our most recent master plan acknowledged over $300 million in deferred maintenance. We have to achieve sustainability. This opens up a toolkit of potential economic development tools which could be very greatly received and ensure our sustainability for future generations of Texans. And again, ensure that every year we can host the Great State Fair of Texas along with numerous other activities and provide those corny dogs that we're so well known for. Okay, I'm still having trouble. It sounds like at the end of the day, all you're really asking is to keep the, what would normally go to the state as far as sales tax. Uh, there is a governance mechanism, but in particular, this activates a portion of reinvestment for those uh, state taxes and revenues to go into the development of hotels which do not currently exist. So this is something that will promote economic development, and again, in the future, will create a very positive uh, benefit for the state of Texas as well. What would be different than any other community saying we'd like to keep all the state sales tax to invest in our own community? Uh, I'll defer that to Chairman Anchia, but I will tell you uh, there's the mechanism he spoke about which builds qualified convention center hotels that has been very successfully applied in uh, not only Dallas, but other municipalities around the state. Okay. okay members, any more questions? Nope. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair calls John Kroll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. My name is John Kroll, representing the State Fair of Texas. Uh, Big Tex says howdy. Um, <laughs> we are in support of House Bill 5282 and thank. Uh, Mr. Anchia for bringing that forward. Um, it, we are working with all the stakeholders and hope to have a really good bill that everyone can support. Mr. Gates, to answer, I think, to at least try to answer part of your question, we're talking about, and I think the way the bill is currently drafted, is the incremental increase in state revenue that would happen after these new developments take place. So the base revenue the state's getting now on, on those revenue streams would continue to flow that direction to the state. It's just the incremental increase in that that would go to help um, fund some of those improvements at the park. That's the way I read the bill right now. I defer kind of on the on the specifics of that to uh, Chairman Chia. But anyway, that's my understanding. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any more questions? Thank you. Okay, is there anyone else wishing to testify on for or against House Bill 5282? Hearing none, the chair recognizes Chairman Chia. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. I'm glad Representative Gonzalez uh, comes back because this is when Dallas gets to shine. This, these uh, assets are both in and around her district and my district, or Benton Jones district, Representative Jones, I should say. And important, they're important institutions. There's so much development happening at the doorstep of representatives, uh, Representative uh, Gonzalez's district, and this will be another tool to drive revenue. Gary, sorry, Vice Chair. If, if nothing gets built, there's no increment. So what, what is required to, to do is you build the hotel, you're able to recapture the, or rebate actually is the right term, the sales and use tax, the hotel op occupancy tax, and the um, mixed beverage tax from the hotel use once you build it, and that gets rebated back to the property. You can pay off bonds, but it's supposed to be used for economic development so that ultimately the increment that you're looking at when the project is done is far in excess of the floor that you have today. So it's a good deal for the state because ultimately things get built, economic development happens, and then you're, you're talking about a much higher tax increment once these bonds uh, burn off, right? And the, the only difference here is we're putting it in an MMD because the city and the park are two separate entities and we needed a governance structure to administer these funds. That's it. But this is something that we've done probably, when, when I carried the economic development bill for qualified hotel center project, I think it was the session before you came in, but there were probably, I don't know, on that bill, and I, and I know there's snapper cars here, but there were probably 40 of these projects that were authorized around the state in state statute. It's already been used in Fort Worth, in San Antonio, in Houston, and in Dallas for convention center hotel projects. And so this is something that has existed in state law for a long time. Yeah, I, I guess I'm, I didn't know that you that it was funded this way i, I thought a mm -hmm. local city if they wanted to build a convention center they would raise you know go out and get bonds and then raise their own taxes to cover that when, when is the state you, you said the increment so if you build the hotel when, when now it's it's occupied and kicking off taxes and so is that when the state gets starts getting its money back no, or, or it starts after a time certain, right? After usually what happens is you, you have this predictable revenue stream, which is the state share, right? Which is pledged. And again, this is something that's been done many times throughout the state. But you take the state share, usually float bonds on the front end for whatever the, the, the hotel is. And then those revenues are the predictable res revenue stream that retire the bonds. Okay. And if, and if you want me to, I, I'm happy to visit with you about it and we can diagram it out and show you the flow of funds. Okay, it's the, from building the hotel yep. and when they start. There's no taxes, hotel there. There's, no, there's, there's none see, right now. So you have the baseline. And so you're gonna build the hotel and when it's built and it starts generating tax revenue, you're just gonna keep the state's part. For a time. And that, how, how long is that time? I have to look in the bill. I think in this, we're, we're anticipating 30 year bonds. So, and you'll burn off the bonds, right? You'll pay them. In the case of, oh gosh, the American Airlines Center, it was paid off early. The bonds were paid off early. And at that point, when you, when you get rid of your debt obligation, then the money reverts back to the state. But the state doesn't own the asset. They No, no. It is a state program for local economic development. And it's existed for a long time. Okay. Representative Tepper? To continue that, but after 30 years, those taxes, will, after the bond is settled, I guess a 30 year note, the, then those revenues would go back to the state? Correct. Is that right? At a much higher increment. And so it's kind of sunsetted a little bit. That's right. Is there a limitation? Uh, so it's like tax in increment financing, but utilizing the, the sales tax revenue. There's an entire um, <clears throat> code section de devoted in state statute. And again, we did the recodification in 2019, but de devoted to qualified hotel projects. And um, I'm happy to circulate that, that code section. It's been around for a while. Is there a limitation on what you can build? Is it limited to hotels or? Other hotels and ancillary development usually within 2,500 feet in the original in the original legislation because these fall outside of the 2,500 feet. That's why we're doing a separate bill to capture more of the of the land, the the park and the and the zoo together. Right on. 
and any, um, so outside of the park and the zoo boundaries, would it affect that? No. Interesting. Just what happens on the footprint. Great. That Thank is city-owned. Thank you. No. Thank you. Okay, so if you, sorry about that. When you, um, so whatever it is that we give permission for, there, part of this, it doesn't say the amount of the bonds, it doesn't say the development, you're gonna go back and figure that out later? Yeah, this is simply authorization. They may choose not to do it. They may choose never to float bonds, they may choose never to build. This is just the authorization to do so. Right. And there's a predictable revenue stream that comes along with that if they do. But, but when you, um, and so they'll figure out later what they want to build and and then what bond they're going to go and well, what if they get started and they decide to add something else? Could they go out and do another bond placement and add it to this bond or is it, is it, it can continue? You probably couldn't get two sets of bonds. I'd think, you know, you'd have covenants for your first set of bonds that would not allow you to take on additional indebtedness and that's unless that was approved by the bondholders. But I mean, conceivably, it's just not how financing would work in this case. Okay. Because you usually have covenants going forward when you float bonds. Um, uh, Representative Cunningham. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just one more question, because I, I think I'm on board now. Uh, with the governance that you guys are still working on, yeah. and we talk about the bond, bond indebtedness, how about the, if, if it would, was to happen, the dissolving of the organization? Dissolving of the MMD, yeah, you yeah, mean? Right. Yeah, all, all MMDs have uh, dissolution provisions. This, these are no different than those you'd find in, in state law. Okay, okay, Yeah. good, good. Thank you, Chairman. I appreciate you, thank you. Thank you, members, for this time. Thank you, Chairman. If there are no further questions, I questions? close. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. With that, the chair withdraws the committee sub for House Bill 5282 and leaves it pending at this time. Chair lays out House Bill 5311 and recognizes Representative Toth. Chairman, members, thank you. My wife and I moved to the Woodlands Township over 20 years ago, and uh, it's the most amazing uh, place to live. Um, this past week in the House and in the Senate, we, uh, we spent a moment to honor the memory of Jim Blair. Jim and his uh, wife Nelda are two of the matriarchs and patriarchs of the Woodlands along with George Mitchell. And the purpose of HB 5311 is to um, create a local bill that will enable the township to maintain that standard of excellence. During COVID, um, when cities had shut down all over the United States and conventions were being canceled all over the place. This is one of the really coolest things is that in a literally a week and a half period, 10 days, um, a major corporation that was supposed to be going to Las Vegas got shut down during COVID and the economic um, development area actually created the ability for these, this huge corporation to bring their convention to the woodlands uh, in just a seven day period. It's just a magical place and we wanna continue to preserve it. And House Bill 5311 will enable the Woodlands Township to do that. It enables them to receive a portion of the mixed beverage tax collected by the state within the area of the township. So one of the things that you, you requested, um, Vice Chair, was how much of that? It's 10.7% of the tax revenue that goes back to the state of Texas. It normally goes to a local, local city municipality but it's being held by the state right now and the other 10.7% goes to the county. And in this case, it would go to the township. So it creates an assessment zone um, based on economic development if requested by the local hotels within the township and uses collective proceeds to promote hotel and related economic activity. Um, originally, the township was created in 1974 and the township is unincorporated <clears throat> and uh, it does provide ec uh, governmental services for the area comprised of, of roughly 28,500 acres with a, with a population of roughly 120,000 people. And I, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on this. We, we have an expert specialist that is available or a subject expert that is gonna testify on this as well, Howard Cohen. And uh, I asked for the opportunity to close. 
upon okay. upon conclusion of that. Yes, sir. Members, any questions? Okay, we'll let you reserve the right to close. Thanks so much. Yes, sir. Members, we have two two witnesses test, registered to testify. Chair, Chair calls Ann Schneider. <laughs> Thank you for being here, ma'am. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and also committee members. My name is Ann Snyder and I am chairman of the Woodlands Township Board. And I'm here in my official capacity testifying in favor of House Bill 5311. First of all, thank you all for allowing me to testify and a thank you to Representative Toth for bringing this bill forward. The Woodlands, as uh, Representative Toth said, was founded by Mr. George P. Mitchell in 1974, located in Montgomery County, and is one of the most prominent residential and business communities in the United States. Today, the Woodlands is home to 120,000 residents and many businesses, all with an aggregate value of almost uh, 30 billion. The Woodlands Township is the provider of an array of services uh, to the Woodlands residents including economic development, public safety, parks, recreation, covenant enforcement, waste disposal services, among others. House Bill 5311 will enhance the township's ability to continue to provide these high quality services by enabling it to receive a share of the mix, mixed beverage tax and to, at the request of the hoteliers, create a special hotel economic zone, development zone within its boundaries. We have worked with all relevant stakeholders and all are supportive of the passage of House Bill 5311. I appreciate the opportunity uh, this afternoon to testify and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, members, any questions? No questions. Thank you, Dr. Schneider. If not, thank you. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Uh, Chair calls Howard Cohen. Thank you for being here, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, committee members. Howard Cohen with the law firm of Schwartz, Page, and Harding in Houston. I am uh, here as uh, general counsel for the Woodlands Township and uh, rep uh, testifying for the bill. I uh, don't have anything uh, to add other than what uh, Dr. Schneider said, but I'm happy to answer any questions on the bill. Members, any questions? No questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Is there any, anyone else wishing to testify on for or against House Bill 5311? Hearing none, the chair recognizes Representative Toth to close. Thank you, Chairman and members. Niche.com ranks the Woodlands Township as the number one place to live in the United States. We're pretty, pretty, I know, sorry, bro. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're pretty proud of it. And if you have any dealings that take you to the Houston area, um, we welcome you to stop by and visit our vibrant community and experience the traditional values and hospitalities. And with that, I ask for a favorable consideration and thanks for your time. Yes, sir. Thank you, Representative Toth. Members, any questions? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you just haven't been there, man. You'd love it. We build a lot of swimming pools there, which you'd love that. Golf courses. Golf courses. There you go. Okay. All right. Thank you. With thank that, you so much. Thank you. Uh, with that, the, the chair will withdraw House Bill 5311 and leave it pending at this time. Uh, the, Chair lays out House Bill 2822 and recognizes Representative Garcia to explain the bill. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Chairman Lozano, um, Vice Chair Gates, and members of the Urban Affairs Committee. House Bill 2822 would establish a study to examine the unique housing needs of youth facing aging out of the foster care system, the juvenile justice system, and the child who has been impacted by both. I had some great things to say here to you, but um, I decided that I was going to share something with you all. Um, 
I grew up in the foster care system. I was impacted by the juvenile justice system. I spent time in group homes. I depended on the goodwill of strangers, the goodwill of my friends' families um, to provide me a safe place to lay my head. Um, I remember being eight years old living in the streets with my mother who suffered from addiction. I remember trying to find bushes where I could sleep because I knew people couldn't see me underneath bushes. Um, one of those days I woke up in a, in a public park and of course every kid loves to be in the park so I started playing. Um, that was the first time I became incarcerated because I didn't know where my mommy was. So um, here in Texas, um, more than 1,200 youth Texans age out of the foster care system every year. They're unadopted and unwanted. And these children face difficulties accessing essential financial, educational, and social supports that could set them up for a successful adulthood. As a result, a quarter of our former foster children across the country experience homelessness within four years of aging out of the system. As you heard examples of us experiencing homelessness in the system, upon my release from um, the juvenile justice system, I again found refuge and solace within families of my friends who took me in and gave me safety. More than likely, these children are also impacted by the juvenile justice system and have long-term negative effects on their lives. Um, I like to refer to these children as duly impacted. Um, it, it increases our risk for future incarceration and increases barriers to access housing and good paying jobs. I'm here today because I made the decision to join the Air Force at 16 years old. I knew I, I couldn't live the rest of my life couch surfing, and I knew nothing else, and I thought that the military would be the one place that would help me live a normal life while serving my country. And while we know national statistics and many factors contribute to high rates of homelessness, this state of Texas would greatly benefit of a study from this study that we can so we can determine what the issues are of the children that are leaving these institutions and we can face these issues head on. This isn't a new issue. I'm 46 years old this year. And to hear stories from my constituents and from other Texans that are still experiencing such hardships, House Bill 2822 would address that. Um, it would meet the challenge by requiring the Texas Interagency Council of, Ho of Homelessness to evaluate the risk of homelessness of our duly impacted youth. This group of agencies would evaluate programs aimed at helping these children succeed in independent living and to make recommendations on improvements that they may need. And with that, um, I ask for your consideration of House Bill 2822, and I reserve my right to close. Thank you. Yes, Representative. Members, any questions? Okay, no question at this time, ma'am. We'll let you uh, have the right to close. Chair, uh, Chair calls Lauren Rose. Hello. Good afternoon, Lauren Rose, the Director of Public Policy at Texas Network of Youth Services. We're a network of youth serving providers who serve youth across youth serving systems, including youth in foster care, youth experiencing homelessness, um, and youth in juvenile justice system here in support of um, House Bill 2822. First, want to uh, thank Representative Garcia for bringing this bill and for sharing um, some of her story and why this legislation is important to her. Um, I do want to share that what she shared about her experience in the system, aging out of the system, is fairly normal for youth exiting foster care. We, a lot of our work is listening directly to those who have been systems impacted, um, and we hear similar stories all of the time, but always think it's important for folks, for folks to share them. Um, but we know that youth exiting out of systems are more likely to experience homelessness um, for a variety of reasons. We don't necessarily know all of them, but uh, conflict that leads them from being kicked out of their housing, um, not understanding how to navigate housing, how to get housing, not having a supportive adult to sign their lease. I think most of us had parents sign our leases, right, when we first left home. Um, and we appreciate that this bill um, in its recommended study focuses on addressing the drivers that lead to homelessness and the supports that prevent homelessness. Uh, research tells us that between 31 and 46% of youth who age out of foster care will experience homelessness by the age of 26. Uh, we hear frequently from youth who have aged out of care that the second they turned 18, they wanted to leave foster care so they don't go into extended care. But then when they realize how hard it is to maintain housing, 
um, they want to go back into care, but oftentimes there's no longer housing or placement for them, and so they can't go back into extended care. Uh, we also work with the Texas Juvenile Justice Department when we can to help. Um, we get calls at being asked if we can help find housing or placements for youth aging out of the state secure facilities uh, because if they cannot find a placement for them because their families won't accept them, they don't have families to go to, they have to release those uh, youth into homelessness. Uh, but we know that that problem is much greater than just not having access to housing when youth leave the systems. Um, Oftentimes, systems, youth who are involved in systems are become disconnected from school, and so when they've aged out, they're disconnected from work and cannot afford that housing. Um, and then finally, uh, I just think it's important to note that youth experiencing homelessness are at high risk of commercial sexual exploitation or trafficking. 25% of youth and young adults who experience homelessness in Texas are trafficked. So when we look at um, ways to prevent um, youth aging out of systems into homelessness. We're also looking at preventing their trafficking, potential trafficking later in the future. Uh, thank you for your time. Happy to answer any questions. Okay. Members, any questions? Yes, sir. Professor Bernal. Thank you for being here. Um, I, the question I have has to do with this is my fifth session. And in all that time, the challenges of kids aging out of the foster care system has been something we've talked about over and over again. And I, I, I'm sort of frustrated. I, I'm, I'm, I know that I know that the representative is frustrated. It's her first session. I'm frustrated because it's my fifth. Um, what are the two or three, or maybe there's more basic things we have to do so we sort of move along on this? What, what, what are you hoping that that study would contain to give us guidance to finally <clears throat> do something about it? Because it just feels like everyone here and all of our colleagues out there will nod their head and say, okay, and yet here she is, freshman, trying to solve this problem that we keep talking about and not doing anything about. So when that when the study finally comes out, what are you hoping it has so that we actually do something that makes the next day different for these kids? Yeah, I mean, I think part of it's listening to the young people who've experienced that and asking it, what is it that they needed? Um, I mean, I think part, like, there's a, I think there's a multiple factors that drive this, right? But what is it that needs to click and help them understand um, the urgency of planning for housing as they're aging out? How do we better plan to age out into something that's successful? How do we make sure that they are supportive and understand the supports that are available to them, but also looking at some kind of permanency supportive adult that can continue um, in their lives and be supportive of them? But then also, what other do we need to be building out community supports to support them as they've as they're transitioning out, right? Like, I think it's looking at multiple facets, but also what is it that the, that the young people need? I think oftentimes we talk about it as what do we think they need, but we're not in their shoes, so making sure we're listening to them as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Members, any more questions? Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on for or against House Bill 2822? Hearing none, the Chair recognizes Representative Garcia to close. Thank you, Chairman, members on the Urban Affairs Committee. Most 18-year-olds have a very difficult time living on their own for the first time. Youth who went through the foster care system have a unique set of traumas. Most of us are victims of abuses unimaginable. Some have been involved in juvenile justice system during their time in foster care. And we're typically um, less likely to have been taught the important skills necessary to be productive adults of um, any community, much less um, a non-abusive productive community. And House Bill 2822 simply creates a study to allow us to examine the housing needs of these duly impacted children. Um, this bill would provide much needed data and, and recommendations to the legislator so that we're not here for five sessions with no answer. This is my very first session. Um, and I couldn't be more honored to be here for many reasons. Um, but I share with you my stories, not for sympathy or you know anything like that, but just to give a real life view of how we're still worth something. Um, I never thought I'd be a state representative, I mean, given my past, but there's 1,200 young adults who could be state representative too. 
So we just ask that you please, um, if there's no further questions, please consider a favorable um, pass of House Bill 2822. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely, Representative, uh, Representative Romero. Thank you, um, Representative, for sharing your beautiful story and for having the courage to share it the way you do. You truly are a, a perfect shining example of how when you put your mind to it, you can do anything, including being state representative or wherever else you decide to go on from here. You really represent your district well, and I commend you on this bill. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned to Representative Bernal as well, and I'm sure you can work on this, is the amount of children that are coming out of foster care that have access to, to college and the very low rate of those that actually do take advantage of that. And I mean, that's, that's housing when you're in a dorm. I know that's gonna be a hard transition, but one that I'm sure you'll accept and, and work on. So thank you for this bill. Yes, sir, absolutely. And I stand committed to to work with higher education um, and to try to get those programs filled. Um, and, and if I may just share a little bit in the military and, you know, my fellow freshman Tepper there is a former Air Force guy too. So, you know, we're encouraged to go to school. Um, and to get a degree is a dream for a lot of us. Um, I went to five different colleges. I changed my major four or five times, countless times. When it came time to get my bachelor's degree, I had so many credits, I wasted about 40 of them. I tell you this because not all of us are made for school, if I'm honest. Um, some of us try real hard, but um, a lot of us have faced traumas in our lifetime that, you know, we don't have the, the same type of, of skills, but we want to. And so it's my commitment, you know, that I work with other children who are aging out to try to help them, you know, realize that it is hard, yes, but there is, is definitely a way. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, Representative. I'm, a, I'm aware of the, some of the issues we're having with foster care. Um, and this might be outside the scope of your bill, but would it be advisable, do you think, is your maybe personal opinion that we extend the foster care age to an older age or have a transitional period between 18 and older? What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely, absolutely. One thing that we really don't think of is um, behavioral and mental age. So whereas some of us you know, present as 20 year olds, a lot of times, the mental impact leaves them oftentimes at the age of abuse, which for young men sometimes is early childhood and young women as well, but with young men in early childhood, they tend to regress to more juvenile behaviors and things like that. And I am not a psychologist, psychiatrist. Yeah, the I'm not trained lower. at all, but <laughs> mental health is a huge um, factor of things that we need to address. So I would be a great, um, I, I would be an advocate for um, extending the age of foster care definitely because although 18 is a legal age, we still need support at that age. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Or is there any more questions? Thank you, Representative. Do I say I close? I, yep. I, that's it? Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Representative. Uh, with, with that, the chair will withdraw uh, House Bill 2822 and leave it pending at this time. Uh, the chair recognizes Representative Ordaz uh, to lay out House Bill 1492. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Lozano, Vice Chair Gates, members. I appreciate the opportunity to pre present this legislation. As you all are aware, Texas shares a border with New Mexico, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and Mexico. Our cities need tools to help us reshore jobs to Texas and grow employment in our state. Local leaders in El Paso have expressed interest in expanding economic development tools at their disposal to make the city more competitive and attracting businesses. House Bill 1492 seeks to amend the law to allow conveyance of land as part of 380 agreements to create more opportunities to bring business to the state. There are alternatives to conveyance through Chapter 380 agreements. However, these are very lengthy processes requiring additional actions that tend to deter companies from locating in Texas. 
utilizing Chapter 311 of the Texas Tax Code, such as a creation of a tax increment reinvestment zone, also known as TERS, is a lengthy process that involves creating a fund to set aside incremental tax revenue generated by development within the zone for other projects that benefit that zone. Additionally, creating an economic development corporation or, e or EDC requires the establishment of a corporation by the governing body of the municipality, appointment of board members, the filing of applications, and the transfer of city-owned real property to the corporation. The ability to convey property through a 380 agreement allows the process to move much more quickly, which is important for every single one of these companies looking to locate to Texas. HB 1492 creates another tool for our great state to remain an economic powerhouse. Among the cities anticipated to drop cards in support of this initiative are Houston, Corpus Christi, Sugarland, Dallas, Irving, and Plano. Thank you, Chair Lozano, Vice Chair Gates, members. I reserve the right to close. Okay, members, any questions? Okay, we'll let you reserve the right to close. Uh, Chair calls Elizabeth Triggs. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for having me. My name is Elizabeth Triggs and I am the Economic Development Director for the City of El Paso. Um, I'm here to speak uh, on behalf of the city in support of this bill. Um, just want to start again by, by thanking you for the opportunity and thanking Representative Ordaz um, for, for bringing this bill forward. Um, as Representative Ordaz mentioned, this bill is just another tool um, for us um, to, to make ourselves more strong when we're competing um, for projects that bring with them large capital investment, which diversifies our tax base, um, and also high quality and higher paying jobs for our community and for our region. Um, this bill, if passed into law, allows us to um, compete more successfully. It facilitates the use of city-owned land assets. Um, the city of El Paso is very fortunate um, in that it owns well over 11,000 acres of land. Not all of that is appropriate for um, industrial development, advanced manufacturing, but a good share of it is. Um, about 5,000 acres of land in the northeast portion of our city is uh, undeveloped, contiguous land. Um, it is far enough away from residential development development that it makes sense for industry, and it's just a huge opportunity. Um, as Representative Ordaz mentioned before, there, there are other avenues to convey land directly to an entity, a company that we're working with, um, but, but they take extra steps and they take extra time. And I think that one thing that we've learned in um, responding to RFIs from the state and being shortlisted on a number of projects is that, um, you know, the, the speed to market is critical. Um, shovel readiness certainly plays a role in that, but also the ability to convey land quickly and easily in a way that mitigates the risk for the companies, um, while also, um, you know, minimizing the number of steps that you have to take. Um, Representative Ordaz mentioned Chapter 311 of the Texas Tax Code, which is a great tool, but it is very cumbersome when all you're looking to do is convey the land directly to a company. It, it requires you to create funds. Um, it takes a long time to do. Um, it takes money to do, too. Um, it's it's much more simple for us to um, to incorporate this into an economic development degree, agreement. And what I will say about this bill is that um, it's balanced. It provides um, protections in it um, that ensure there's consideration and agreement that provides consideration for the transfer of land. Um, it also requires public notice. Um, and then I think the, the other important point is that um, the bill is, it just adds flexibility um, to the tools that, that cities and communities have such as Texas and allows us to have much stronger um, incentive packages to put forward. And I'm happy Great. to take any questions. Vice Chair Gates? Um, it's, it's your land, right? Yes, sir. <clears throat> so why do you have to come to the state for permission? So as a city, um, we only have certain, wa certain ways that we can convey land. Um, we're subject to Chapter 272 of the Local Government Code, which requires us to put the land out to bid. Um, we could use a broker. 
Um, but all of those are additional steps rather than just working directly with the company. The, the only real tool that we have um, to work directly with a company to convey the land is through um, Chapter 311 of the Texas Tax Code, which requires creating a tax increment reinvestment zone, a whole process in and of itself. Um, by allowing us to convey land through a Chapter 380 economic development agreement, it just speeds up the process immensely, um, adds a lot of flexibility, and, and just makes it a much easier process for the city and the company to go through. So what what is it, this is just allowing you to bypass putting it up for sale and you just sell directly to a particular company? Yeah, so you work, so when we're working with a company uh, to bring them into our community, we obviously want them as a partner because we've looked at them, we've seen the benefit that they bring to the community, whether that's the capital investment or jobs um, of a higher quality than what we currently have, more jobs. So so they're a, they're a partner and they're someone we wanna work with. And so we wanna simplify that process as much as possible when working with them. And again, I, you know, I think the partnership is not just about performance-based incentives in the form of rebates and those kinds of things, but also looking at what sort of land assets that we have um, to, to really make that incentive package more rich and make it a stronger partnership. And, and this bill allows us to do that. So you're just asking, I, you know, I'm new to this, I'm just trying to figure yes, it out. You're just asking the state to let you negotiate your own deal with a particular business. Via Chapter 380 agreement. And so there are requirements in Chapter 380 as well. Um, it has, you have to show that there is a public purpose for economic development and that the consideration is being provided um, in that agreement. So there are still requirements that must be met. It's, it's not like just you know, selling the land directly to a company. There has to be a public purpose in the form of economic development. And that's all done internally, making sure that it's done correctly? Well, so city council ultimately approves each 380 agreement, so there is a public process. Um, we go through a lengthy process to ensure there's a net benefit to the city. A lot of communities have policies that call out what that benefit needs to look like. The city of El Paso is included in those. Um, so it is a public process. Um, the agreement is not an administratively approved thing. It would certainly go before council. In addition, this bill does require public notice um, in a newspaper as well. Okay. Thank you, Representative I, Tepper. I think you might have answered this. So you can't just sell the land, you'd have to put it up for bid. Is that what you're telling me? You're limited to, to the number of ways that you can sell land. The most common is putting it out to bid. Um, there's also options to work with a broker, but again, if you're looking at a specific company, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So the only other option really is Chapter 311 of the Texas Tax Code, which allows you to work directly with a company to convey land. And that's... It's that, very burdensome. Okay. And are you also... Is an additional uh, positive of this that you're able to maintain certain control over the land as well? It, I mean, so if you include it in a Chapter 380 agreement, um, there's obviously deal points uh -huh. that you know, are unique to each project. So that could be a benefit um, of it. Uh, I think for us, though, we're, we're really looking at the benefit of just being able to move more quickly, which is hugely important right now in the environment that we're in. I guess theoretically you could put deed restrictions in there and such if you wanted to maintain a certain amount of control. Deed I'm not saying that's a bad no, thing. No. I'm not trying to, it's not a gotcha question. I just... No, of course. Yeah. Deed restrictions are always an option, but they affect the value of the land. Um, again, this is... You know, this is when you found a partner that you want to work with that you know is good for your community. Um, just facilitating that partnership is what this bill does. Great, thank you. Yes, sir. Representative Bernal, speed is important. Yes. Because you're because in, and I think it, the part of the layout is the answer, and that is that you're competing with those other places that the representative listed, and if you can't move quickly enough then even though the company might be a good partner, they're also competing with incentive packages being put together by other places. And as time goes on, they're sweetening the deal more and more. And if you're if they're moving steadily, sweetening the deal while you're doing paperwork, you lose. And so the, it's not just that, but it's also because you're sort of this intersection of all these different places, right. you need the ability, tell me if I get this wrong. No. You need the ability to be quick and dynamic because Time is of the, of the essence, and 
these other places don't have the same cumbersome regime that we do, so you're you're racing against time. And 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 and, and the purpose of this is specifically to bring jobs. Yes, sir. Right. It's not for anything else. You're not you're not building uh, El Paso Coney Island unless it's <laughs> unless it's to bring jobs. Like that's right. so when they say economic development, you're competing with all these other places to bring jobs. And if they know that Texas or, or El Paso is is just going through the burdensome process of paperwork, they're sweetening their deal. Absolutely. Right. And then you they're they're already on level six and you're finally ready to go at level one. And then if you have to then continue to sweeten your deal, you've got to start the process all over again. Absolutely. Right. They who, Chicago? Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I promise you their deal isn't sweet. Utah. Georgia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I think one thing that I'll mention, I mean, all of Texas municipalities compete with places like Georgia, Tennessee um, for manufacturing jobs. El Paso is really unique in the sense that um, we are at the farthest western portion of Texas. So a lot of times we're also competing with Utah, um, Nevada, Arizona, um, all of which have done very well in bringing in advanced manufacturing, chips manufacturers, largely because they're closer to, um, you know, a, a, a deep water port than El Paso is. So every tool that we have to make the process faster, easier, and better um, is important to us. Thank you, Jim. Yes, ma'am. Members, any more questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, is there anyone else wishing to testify on for or against House Bill 1492? Hearing none, the chair recognizes Representative Ordaz to close. Thank you, Mr. Trix, and thank you, members, and Representative Bernal. Uh, you should have just laid out this bill for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but just to just to add to uh, Vice Chair Gates's um, questions, you know, when, when we're entering into these 380 agreements, or not we, but municipalities, you know, you have forms of property tax abatement, sale tax abatements. So this just adds another tool in reference to land. So it's an exchange. Currently what we're doing is just adding another tool to an economic development toolbox to ensure that we remain competitive with other, with other states. So I um, thank you all for the questions and thank you for your attention. Um, and I request your favorable consideration and I close. Members, any questions? Thank you all. Thank you so much. Sure. With that, the chair will withdraw House Bill 1492 and leave it pending at this time. Okay, the chair lays out House Bill 834 and recognizes Representative Campos to explain the bill. Good afternoon, Chairman and Vice Chair and members. Um, thank you for the opportunity to lay out House Bill 834 relating to the establishment of a text to donate pilot program. Last session, this bill passed unanimously in the Urban Affairs Committee, but ran out of time in the House. The intent of this bill is to promote and facilitate private donations to local organizations who provide emer emergency services to families who are homeless or at risk of becoming homeless. In order to combat homelessness, the state allocates emergency solution grants, funds homeless housing and service programs, manages transitional housing programs, and administers the the Texas in Homeless Fund. The Text to Donate pilot program complements existing state efforts that seek to stem the rising tide in homeless populations. The Text to Donate pilot would be administered by the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs. Specifically, this legislation will require the department to leverage existing texting technology that is secure and cost effective. Select a tele telecommunications carrier and message service, acquire a statewide phone number with the unique donation codes, create a fund to deposit donations and establish procedures to award contributions to local organizations. Once the program is implemented, individuals would text a code to a statewide phone number. They will then be prompted to select contribution method, donation amount and city destination. I am open for questions and I reserve the right to close. Okay. Members, any questions? Okay, no questions. We'll let you reserve the right to close. Yes. Uh, members, so, uh, 
Oh. No, okay. HB 834 is straightforward and complements existing state effort, efforts to combat homelessness by providing an additional revenue stream for local organizations. Okay. So I will tell you, I came about this bill because right before COVID, um, I came across a family that was in dire straits and in need at the grocery store. And so it was a mom and dad with three little girls and you know they, they were homeless, but it was COVID, so I couldn't get them any help with any kind of nonprofits because nobody was doing anything. So what I did is I set them up in a motel and I was working with other organizations um, and I knew that eventually I would get them a voucher, but because of the times were so hard. So I did a GoFundMe and I was able to keep them in a motel for a month until I got their voucher. So this is where my bill stems from. And so I ask for your support. Okay, I, th I think we have one witness. Uh, before you close, we'll call up the one witness and then. Okay, absolutely. Thank uh, you. Chair calls Eric Samuels. Eric Samuels. <laughs> okay. Uh, one more. Okay, we will uh, show Eric Samuels uh, for the bill, uh, but not wishing to testify. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on for or against House Bill 834? Hearing none, the chair recognizes Representative Campos to close. Again, thank you so much for the opportunity, and I ask for your support on this bill. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, gentlemen. Give me local consent. And Jessica. Yeah. <laughs> well, we yeah, we could just do it today. Well, That'd be great. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm good with it. <laughs> thank well, you. Bear County sticking up. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Always. Thank yeah. you, guys. Okay, thank you. With that, the chair will um, withdraw House Bill 834 and leave it pending at this time. Chair lays out House Bill 3980 and recognizes Representative Frazier to explain the bill. Down comes Frazier. <laughs> Come on now. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman, Vice Chair, and members. I've got uh, HB 3980. It's a firefighter business lead bill. Uh, it's very similar to the one we passed in the, I think it was the 86, 80 somewhere in there, 83rd actually, uh, for the police and police officers. And so what this current bill does, is, or could do, uh, is allows firefighters and municipalities with a population of one million or greater to bracket a bill for Dallas uh, that are law enforcement association, members of their association donate one hour community municipal vacation or compensatory time, uh, leave time to a business leave account, their own time going to this account. And what that does is allow them for, you know, when their association's doing stuff for, when they're going through their uh, contract negotiations, coming down here, instead of burning that time, they can use that business leave time. Then that time is repaid by the association back to the municipality that they work for, Dallas. Uh, it's been used for many, many years for us to conduct business down here. It's worked very well. We've never had a problem with it. Uh, we actually have City of Dallas are on the bill and all the associations are for the bill. Um, we do have somebody here to, uh, from one of the firefighters if you want to hear from him, but that's the simple gist of this bill. Okay, Representative Cortez. Rep Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Frazier, this bill is f um, for what city again? Dallas. It's bracketed oh. for Dallas. Okay, so it's bracketed to yes, Dallas. Sir. But your roots are from San Antonio. <laughs> uh, they are, Mr. Four Touchdowns. Yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> Not that anyone was counting how many touchdowns I had to yes. become the MVP. Yes, but, they are. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, I don't know if you knew that, Diego. His roots are San Antonio. Southside, right? Southside. Southside. Yeah. Impressive. Yes, we are. We're Southside, baby. <laughs> we look forward to working with you on San Antonio bills. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Members, any more questions? Okay, uh, I think we have one witness. We'd yes, like to reserve the right to close, and I'll come back in just a second. Yes, sir. Uh, chair calls Chris Peterson. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, uh, representatives, um, chair. <clears throat> My name is Chris Peterson. I currently uh, serve as the uh, third vice president for the Dallas Firefighters Association. Um, Representative Frazier laid out the bill uh, pretty well of what it's going to do for us. And just for the record, sir, you're, you're testifying uh, on behalf of the Firefighter Association and yourself? Yes, sir. Okay. And okay. And you're for the bill? Yes, sir. I am for the bill. Okay. Yes, sir. Go ahead. 
Um, 3980 uh, will help us with business leave. Uh, that that bill um, <clears throat> will allow us to do the, the business that we have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, right now, we use our own time uh, to come down here. We use our own time to uh, help uh, represent our membership when it comes to uh, their day-to-day -to -day business being. Uh, that, that could be a chain of command hearing. It could be a disciplinary hearing. It could be anything. And uh, <clears throat> we just hope that um, we can get this passed through. Uh, and it'll be, you know, just like what the police department has, uh, what the police association has. Uh, we want to be able to uh, uh, be able to, to use that time uh, to help benefit our members um, down the line. Um, the city is, is on board with it. Um, uh, due to the fact that we're going to pay back the halftime. Uh, the police don't have that side of it because they um, they don't have mandatory staffing uh, levels that we do. Uh, we have to ride four around on our, our apparatus. So um, <clears throat> when we first looked at this bill and we were going to move forward on it, we had to change the language to it a little bit uh, in order for the city to be on support, be support with it. So uh, it's cost neutral to the city at this point. So we, uh, uh, we'd appreciate your support on it. Great. Members, any questions? No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on for or against House Bill 3980? Hearing none, the chair recognizes Representative Frazier to close. Chairman, Vice Chair, and committee members, thank you so much. I, you guys heard it. Uh, it's a very simple bill. It's a local. I'd love this bill to go to local consent as well. Uh, if we could, uh, it's. Uh, it's a very important for these guys to get their business done when they're when they're needing it done and, and not volunteering their time and, and uh, where they can use that business leave. I really appreciate that and thank you for the time and close. Okay, thank you. Members, any questions? Thank you. With that, the chair will withdraw House Bill 3980 and leave it pending at this time. The suits on the board fall. Oh, I'm going to do kind of hands. Yeah. I'll let them. Okay. I'll lay it up. Yeah. Okay. You could do it from there, bro. Oh, yeah. Phil. Phil. You could do it from there. Or. All right. All right. I think they're coming because that's the most busted staffer. Okay. Hey, Chair Canales. It's it. <laughs> oh, this this country right there. Oh, this is beautiful. Oh, there he is. Oh man. Just finished voting. I'm sorry. Just finished voting. I'm sorry. It's about to kill him. Yeah. I'll let you handle this. Okay, the, the chair lays out House okay. Bill four 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 three and recognizes Representative Cunningham to explain the bill. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair Gates, and uh, committee members, and uh, thank you for your patience. My apologies. I uh, want to say once again, thank you for allowing me to lay out House Bill 43, 4443 uh, before you today. In 2021, the Texas Department of Housing Affairs was allocated $32 million in one-time funding for the, from the federal government for the Home American Rescue Program Plan. Since then, TDHCA has programmed these funds to private developers for the development of rental, rental housing and non-congregate shelter, as well as operating costs and capacity building for eligible nonprofit organizations undertaking development and administrations. Currently, the Texas Government Code Section 2306.111 creates barriers to distribution of these funds. This bill seeks to address that issue. As outlined by the government code, the rule 95-5 <coughs> rule stipulates that 95% of the state's home funds be used in non-participating jurisdictions, which are areas of the state that do not receive home funds directly from the federal government, and which are areas that tend to, to, uh, tend to be rural. Due to the fact that these the rural areas often like the high capacity organizations necessary to expend funds, and the fact that the urban, urban areas have the largest concentrations of population in need, there is a need to exempt these funds from the 95-5 rule and, and for the uh, regional allocation formula to allow an expenditure distribution of funds. The permanent change in the statutes to exempt one-time funding from the 95-5 rule and the regional allocation formula will allow for efficient disbursement 
of funds and significantly decrease the risk of the states remitting home funds back to the federal government now and in the future. Uh, thank you uh, for your time and consideration, and I reserve my right to close. Okay, members, any questions? Okay, let's see. Uh, okay, um, is there anyone else wishing to testify on House Bill 4443? Hearing none, the chair recognizes Representative Cunningham to close. You know, it's a long day when you ran off and forget your glasses, and I think I read that pretty good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Vice Chair Lozano, Vice Chair Gates, members, uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to present this bill before you today. I respectfully ask for your favorable consideration, consideration, and I close. Okay. Thank you, Representative. Uh, with that, the chair will withdraw House Bill 4443 and leave it pending at this time. Okay, members, I'm gonna uh, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna lay out uh, Representative Vasut's bill. Oh. Uh, chair lays out House Bill 1153. Um, actually, what's it? Well, I'll keep, I gotta keep going. Okay, members, uh, Texas law currently recognizes multiple types of municipalities, including home rule, special law, and type A, B, and C general law municipalities, um, with certain differing governing structures, obligations, and powers. Uh, members, uh, the purpose of this bill, uh, <laughs> you can just, you can just, uh, yeah, okay. you can just stop and like, okay. 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 Well, you're doing a great job. Members, uh, I'm, I'm going to yield uh, <laughs> to Representative Vasut to continue uh, the layout of House Bill 1153. Well, thank you, Chair. Uh, members, apologies, I just had to wrap up a brief phone call, but uh, I'm sure you're doing a great, great job. It's a great <laughs> bill. Um, let me tell you a little bit of why I filed it. So I have a small town in my district, the town of Quintana. It's one of the old towns. Uh, been around for a very long time in the state of Texas. Now, it was originally, or had at one point in time, been incorporated as a type A municipality many, many, many years ago. Fast forward to today, the population has steadily declined to now it only has 26 people. When you have a type A city, you gotta have five people to run the city, you know, four council members and a mayor. They're having a hard time fielding that with 26 people that can't be related. So. This bill simply takes away the floor uh, for cities to be able to, by an election, transfer from a type A down to a B or down to a C. Uh, that's all it does. It'll benefit not only Quintana, but also many other small towns. Um, I think, I, to be honest with you, I don't know why the floor was really ever put in there. Uh, I can understand the ceiling, right, because as a city grows, it needs more power in certain circumstances. But if a city shrinks, it also ha ought to have the flexibility to be able to move down from a type A to a type B or to a type C. And I think for Quintana, uh, their particular preference, of course, they need to move to a type C so that they can go down to only three people uh, that are not related around the city. And, and if, it, if it falls anymore, then I might have to come back. We might have to come up with some other solution in 20 or 30 years, but I think, I think that's for another day. But for now, I think this would really help them. Okay. Members, any questions? No questions. Uh, is there anyone else wishing to testify on for or against House Bill 1153? Uh, seeing, hearing no one, uh, the chair recognizes Representative Vasut to close. Thank you for your consideration. And uh, if uh, the committee is willing and if it meets the criteria, uh, I'd love to see it go to local and consent, but defer to your judgment, of course. And thank you guys very much. I know, I know, I know. What do you think, Tepper? I, I, did, I did get a breath mint from the fill, oh. you know, fill station. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, okay. guys. Thank you. With that, you should have let the chair finish. Yeah. Would have gone right to oh, local yeah. consent. <laughs> With that, no. <laughs> With that, the chair withdraws House Bill 1153 and leaves it pending at this time. 
the chair lays out House Bill 1434 and recognizes the honorable and distinguished Chairman Buckley. I was looking for somebody else. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman uh, Lozano, Vice Chair Gates, uh, for the opportunity to be here. This sort of stays in the same lane as that you just heard. Uh, um, this bill came to me because of a, a little community in, in my uh, district called Morgan's Point Resort, kind of su suffering, I guess, if you will, the, the exact opposite of what's going on there in, in Vasut's district. But currently, when the governing body of a type A general law municipality does not have staggered terms for their, for their aldermen, that governing body does not have the authority to opt for staggered terms. So in other words, they elect everybody all at once, and uh, they could have complete turnover. And having that entire governing body up for election at one time provides for the possibility um, that the, of complete turnover in one election cycle. This can create gover governing instability and difficulties in governing the needs of a municipality, especially when you started from a little simple uh, kind of a fishing village to now a highly desirable place to live with growing pains like many municipalities uh, uh, face. HB 1434 aims to provide the governing body of a type A general law municipality the authority to vote to stagger their terms. HB 1434 amends the local government code to allow the governing body of a type A general law municipality to establish staggered terms of office for its aldermen through a majority vote. This would only apply to municipalities where aldermen are not currently serving staggered terms. The proposed process for establishing the staggering of terms involves the drawing of lots by the alderman. And with that, I'm available for questions, and I thank you uh, for your consideration and reserve my right to close. Thank you, Chairman. Members, any questions? No questions. Okay, is there anyone else wishing to testify on for or against House Bill 1434? Hearing none, the chair recognizes Chairman Buckley, the honorable and distinguished Chairman Buckley, to close. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I appreciate your favorable consideration of this legislation that's important to my district and would request, uh, if you see fit, to send send the bill to local and consent calendars, uh, and I close. Yes, sir. We sure will. Thank you, Chairman Buckley. Thank you. Uh, with that, the chair withdraws House Bill 1434, and we'll leave it pending at this time. Uh, if there's no further business, uh, the House Committee on House Committee on Urban Affairs stands adjourned, subject to call of the chair.